you have taste in a way that's meaningful to software people. Hello, I'm Bill Gates. I would, I would recommend uh, TypeScript. Yeah, it writes a lot of code for me, and usually it's slightly wrong. I'm reminded, incidentally, of Rust here. R R Rust. <laughs> this almost makes me happy that I didn't become a supermodel. Cooper and Nettys. Well, I'm sorry, guys. I, uh, I don't know what's going on. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about large neural networks. It's, it's really an honor to be here. Rust. R R Rust. Data topics. Welcome to the data. Welcome to the data topics podcast. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Data Topics, a plug deep dive, your casual corner of the web where we discuss all about data storytelling with a Altair and AI. My name is Morello. I'll be hosting you today. And I'm joined by Angelica Loduca. Is that did I, did I say your name? Yes. Hi everybody. I'm really excited to be here with you today. All right, we're excited to, to have you here. Uh, you're speaking with us from Italy, is that correct? Yes. Yes, same. All there. right. In Pisa. And, um, very cool. How's the weather there, by the way? Uh, today it's very sunny, but yesterday there was a heavy rain. And so. Ah, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. strange weather. Yeah. So happy to have you here. Uh, we were chatting a bit before we started the, the episode as well. So a lot of cool stuff to talk about, but maybe for people that haven't. Uh, heard about you or don't know about you yet, could you give a little bit of an introduction, like your background, how you got into programming, data science, your past experiences and all these things? Yes, I am a, um, a researcher at the Institute of Informatics and Telematics of the National Research Council in Italy. I, my research interests are data science, data storytelling, data engineering, and also uh, web applications. Um, but uh, uh, my uh, field is in research, but I also have a connection with the industries. And uh, for this reason, I search also for uh, collaborations with the uh, industries uh, and uh, for uh, uh, study uh, topics that are more related to the industry rather than uh, uh, research strictly uh, said. I am also a professor of data journalism at the University of Pisa and uh, um, I has also have uh, like writing very much. I uh, have a blog post, I have written uh, uh, almost four books. I am currently writing the, my fourth books um, and uh, I'm really uh, excited about the topics I study and I investigate. Yes. Very cool. Thank you for the introduction. So maybe a quick question for my curiosity. Data journalism, uh, yeah. what is it about? What, if someone is attending your classes, what can they expect? Uh, yes, data journalism is uh, a subfield uh, of data storytelling because uh, it's communicating uh, news, which is derived from journalism, with uh, derived from uh, data, and uh, it's a very uh, it's a combination. Data journalism is a combination between. Um, Saying, uh, technological uh, requirements given by data, such as data analysis, data exploration, and also communication skills, because you have to communicate um, what you learn from uh, data. Um, compared to uh, data storytelling, which is a broader field, data journalism is more focused to news. And so you have to build uh, stories um, which are uh, fresh, because the news is also is always fresh, and you have to uh, extract this news from uh, uh, data. Yes, this is uh, very, very interesting. interesting. <laughs> My students also always uh, enjoy the course and uh, um, I have uh, different theses, uh, and um, yes, they are very interesting. No doubt. And this is courses for data science people that are following like a data science track, or is it more for people that are following a data like a journalism kind of track thing? No, the, the strange is that uh, this course is the in the um, degrees and the master degrees of uh, uh, digital humanities. 
And so it's very strange because it's a connection between the humanities and technology. And I think it's very fascinating, this uh, aspect. Yeah, that's true. I, is it, uh, do you have a lot of people from different backgrounds, like people that are yes. more technical and less technical? So I guess it's yes. probably a challenge for you as well, right? Having yes. such different yes. backgrounds in the same class. Yes, it's very difficult to manage both. But uh, while in the previous years uh, I focused more on uh, technical programming languages such as Python, uh, over the years I have realized that um, it's better to use other types of tools such as uh, um, Tableau or uh, Power BI to do uh, the visual representations uh, of data because um, some uh, students have uh, difficulties in, um, in uh, writing code, uh, debugging, and uh, so on. But yeah, also I, I encourage them to use um, maybe ChatGPT to correct, to correct uh, errors, while it's not strictly academic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I don't know if that's controversial, but uh, yeah, I think ChatGPT is... Uh relatively new i would say right so i think uh, i think you're pretty quick on adapting to your course if you're already instructing the ins and outs of uh yeah gen ai and i think we're going to talk a bit more when we're talking about your your latest book right so data storytelling with out there in, a, in ai uh, yeah. i think it's out there that you pronounce it but um but before we go there you also mentioned you wrote other books as well yes would you I like to yeah Yes, uh, since I love exploring many different fields, I have written uh, my first book was uh, about data science and um, it, it was focused especially on experiments and how to track your experiments. The title is Comet for Data Science. It was published in 2022 by PACT publication. And uh, mm, the topic uh, is focused on Comet, which is an experimentation platform to track your experiments. Since then, uh, Comet has evolved, and now uh, it also supports uh, uh, MLOPs, uh, and also it's integrated, I think, with uh, um, with the generative AI, but I don't know more in details. Yes, this is this the book, right? Yes, this one. Yes. Um, the second book, uh, I co-authored this book with other people, and is the Learning and Operating Presto, which is uh, uh, by O'Reilly Media, and it's uh, more focused on um, data engineering and how to use the Presto to um, as a search engine as a um, query engine for your uh, system this one is uh, the book and now o'reilly has also provided in his uh, its platform the possibility to read the book in german and uh, um and spanish with an automatic uh, translation and this is very interesting wow. because you can read the book in your own language so and you don't have to write uh, in the other languages. O'Reilly takes care of the translation. <laughs> yes, great. This, this this, nice. Yeah, nice. and I think that the, um, in the near future they also will provide other uh, other uh, languages. The How does this book? work actually? Is it uh, automatic, but then someone validates the translation? Yes, they use a tool, but I don't remember the name. Um, it's an automatic translation using Gen AI, I think. But, ah, yes. <laughs> and cool. in fact, they write also under the book, if you find more uh, some errors, please send us a, a feedback about this uh, so you can they can correct uh, the, the errors. Uh, the third book is uh, this one. This is uh, Data Storytelling with uh, Altair and AI, which uh, was uh, re recently received, re released by Manning Publication. And uh, it's uh, about the last part of the data science uh, uh, workflow, which is uh, data communication. And the focus is on data storytelling. I think that this book fills a gap in the literature because uh, it's focused on Python. And I have uh, met different people 
who say that they build boring charts in uh, Python. <laughs> and in this book, you find uh, different interesting charts and how to uh, declutter them, how to um, modify them, and how to tailor them for your audience uh, and uh, in Python. But you are not alone. You can use Gen AI to help you. And this, uh, I think, it's interesting. And uh, importantly, just last book, I'm writing a, a, a fourth book, which is uh, Become a Great Data Storyteller by Wiley, which will be released uh, by the end of January in uh, um, 2025. And uh, it's a more theoretical book uh, about the concepts of uh, a story, how to extract a story from uh, data. And this is uh, my overview. Wow, this is really cool. So you kind of go uh, end to end, right? You have the more data engineering focus, you have the data science focus, or the MLOps data science with Comet, and then all the way to the data storytelling part. Yes. <laughs> very nice, very nice. So maybe uh, maybe a personal curiosity from me, right? Uh, what motivated you to write so many books um, and why, well, why did you choose these topics as well? But uh, I think there are other ways, like if someone is, they want to share some knowledge today, there are different ways they can do this. They could write blog posts, they could write, uh, they could write a book. Um, so what was the motivation to go for books in this case? Well, uh, the truth is that uh, uh, since I was a child, my dream was to become a writer. And <laughs> Yes. Cool. Yeah. Yes, I wrote different many uh, tales, uh, um, short stories, uh, also fictional stories, which were published by local uh, editors, lo local publishers. Oh, and wow. uh, yes, but uh, then uh, I realized that um, I had to write uh, uh, also in my field. And uh, it's a, a personal uh, um, idea to share uh, knowledge in a book because I think that uh, I have a blog post where I publish many things, uh, I share uh, contents and so on. But a book is uh, more complete. And um, I have uh, many books I like reading and so I also li like uh, writing. And I think that people in a book find uh, more comprehensive guide to uh, do something. The drawback of a book is that uh, it go, maybe the technology uh, can uh, get older uh, before uh, and the book is still uh, there with an old technology. The code maybe doesn't work because it's old, but the principles described in a book are still uh, valid. And I believe in uh, in the importance of uh, of books because you can read it, especially if they are hard copies, they are better. Yeah, I also saw in the um, in the book as well. I skimmed through it. Um, it's also you also mentioned that there is a as a structure, right, to the the topics. Yes. They kind of progress, so it's it's prepared in a way for you to. Um, Kind of go step by step and upgrade your game there so it's i agree it's really cool um and indeed so you also mentioned the challenge right that things move fast in the tech industry um how do you do you have to do anything to mitigate the the changes let's say uh is there something you can do aside from releasing new versions new additions yes uh Firstly, you can uh, uh, write a second edition of a book, but the, I think that the, the most important aspect here is to have a book uh, repository with the code, because uh, every book has, uh, every technical book has a, a GitHub, usually has a GitHub repository with the code, and you can update it. Maybe in the book, the code is still uh, old, but in the repository, you can find the new version. It, uh, it would be very good if uh, readers could contribute to the uh, code um, maintenance. And this was this is a, a very uh, a dream that every writer has, 
because uh, you you don't write for the for the mass you write for the single reader and when a reader reads a, a book um, there is a connection between you and the reader is a it's a personal connection uh, while uh, maybe in a presentation uh, you talk to a, a great audience here in a book you you talk to just one with just one people one person and it's a, a, a very uh, interesting uh, relationship that you the reader establishes with the writer very cool and i also saw on the well i think if you buy the the physical book you also have access to the discussions on the i think it's yes. the many platform so you also have that right which i thought was really really cool <laughs> yes yes uh, unfortunately these discussions um, are not um, very um, appreciated by readers because usually we don't have the time to write uh, but i think that engaging with the author uh, uh, could be very interesting i personally read many books many technological books and once after reading a book i contact the author and ask yes in my blog post i also have some interviews with other authors and I ask, I ask uh, them many questions about the book. And then sometimes I also ask the author to answer my questions and I publish them as a, as a blog post because uh, oh, wow. it's very fun to see in their answers, their writing style. <laughs> because oh, it seems that you are reading again you are still reading the book it's very fun <laughs> no that's a great idea actually that's uh you have any um book recommendations there anyone any book that surprised you on when you ask these questions or many books uh one of the books that i really like is the chart spark by uh, ellie torban this is uh, uh, this. The name seems uh, to suggest something related to charts, but uh, to building graphs. But in, in uh, indeed, this book suggests you how to be creative in your uh, uh, job, and it's very. Uh, I I, pro I suggest you to to read it because it changes your uh, uh, yes. This, is this book that I have on the, I put the book on the screen for people that are just listening, but yes, the charts part. Yes. yes. Harness your creativity in data communication and stand out and innovate. Yes. And maybe it could be very interesting for people dealing with the data, especially who has a, a technical background and uh, believes that creativity belongs only to genius. And it's not. <laughs> <laughs> really cool call out there yes, and that, um the the process of writing a book how like uh, i'm assuming it's it, it's very labor intensive right i'm assuming it takes it takes time there's uh, sending to the publishers and all these things could you talk a bit about like what's the work that goes behind publishing a book yes the first uh, and the most most uh, no not the most and the, the first step is to uh, have an idea uh, and the idea is the most difficult thing because you have to write, the market is full. And so uh, it's very difficult to have an idea approved by a, a publisher because uh, um, there are books about uh, all the topics and you have to be innovative in some way. Some suggestions uh, to have uh, uh, if you want to uh, write a book and uh, get published uh, by a publisher is to um, to do a market analysis on um, on the topics that uh, uh, are uh, trending at the moment, and if you can. Uh, uh, if you know this top one, at least one of these topics, you can uh, combine your idea, your topic, uh, or your experience with this trending uh, idea, the trending topic. And this is the first possibility. Once you have uh, the idea, you have to write the outline 
of the book, which could be should be innovative. All the chapters should be innovative. If you write the same things, you will be rejected. And so you have to, to write something innovative. Then you propose your idea, and when you have uh, the publisher approved the idea, you start writing. Mm -hmm. And I think this is uh, uh, a sort of... Uh, um, you enjoy this, but also you, in some periods, you can view writing the, as a, a, a rock, as something very heavy, uh, because you have deadlines, you have to meet your deadlines, uh, mm -hmm. you have to respect them, and, uh, and you have to write. You can plan to write the, some pages each day, and so uh, before the deadline you have uh, the chapter ready, but you have also to study, because mm -hmm. you don't know everything. To write yeah. a book, you need to study. And if you don't like this, it's not for you. Write a book. <laughs> <laughs> so usually, when the deadlines are more based on chapters, like deliver the first chapter, second chapter, it's more like of a linear thing. Yes, you okay. you see everything chapter by chapter, every because maybe you have to write the, to write the three hundred page. Pages. If you look at the, all the pages, see you become crazy. Crazy. You have to. <laughs> you have to write to see a single chapter, a single page. Today I will write three pages. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I wouldn't be good for writing a book because I. Uh, I sometimes I have a lot of motivation, but then it goes away the next day, and I'm like, ah, now I need to. <laughs> I don't think it would be for me. I do like studying though. Know. And I think it's interesting you mentioned this because uh, I'm sure you learn a lot in writing a book. I also, I'm a believer that in trying to teach people, and I think writing a book is a way of teaching, um, yeah. you also learn a lot, right? So a lot of the times I, I try to do some presentations and sometimes are topics that I'm not very familiar, but in trying to present it to people, I definitely learn a lot. So it's also one way, one of the ways that I really like to to learn stuff and i also feel like it's useful because you're also sharing your knowledge with other people which is always yes nice. i think this is uh, the most uh, valuable thing that you share knowledge and you hope to leave something to others yeah to indeed. give something to others and uh, maybe this the have the effort that you um you employ to do something maybe with this effort you can uh, is the path the way to other people's yes yeah definitely cool maybe uh, how long does it take the whole process from like you have an idea um you contact the publisher all the way to the, the publishing date how long does it usually take it depends uh, on the publisher but uh, usually um, you contact uh, a senior acquisition acquisition editor you personally, I did uh, in this way. You uh, go to LinkedIn. You search for the publishing house that you want to uh, to want publish, and look for senior editors, senior acquisition editors. Then you send uh, them an email, and usually they answer very quick, very quickly. Yes, well, because um, you talk with a direct person. You don't connect, contact the general publishing house. You contact just mm -hmm. one person. And so I see, I see. they answer. It's yes, it's fast. But, but and then you, um, you negotiate with the acquisition editor the topic. Maybe they are not interested in your uh, topic. So you, you need to modify. And if he, uh, finally they are uh, interested, they uh, they accept your proposal and they send the proposal under review to the editorial board. This usually takes uh, two weeks. After these uh, weeks, uh, you have to answer yes or no. And then from that, it takes what, maybe a year for you to have the whole book written out? 
um, or how, or is it more or less? Or to write the whole book, you usually you employ one year, one year. Okay, so it's a lot of work, a lot of work. Yes, but What's sometimes also two years. It depends on oh, the yeah. book. Yes. And what's your favorite part of writing a book? Uh, writing and studying everything, <laughs> but it depends on the book because in some books I also like to insert some personal uh, anecdotes. And yeah. so uh, this is, uh, I think this is the most uh, fun uh, thing because uh, every time you go out uh, with friends, with family, you see everything as a as a possible anecdote to, to uh, insert in your book, and oh, wow. all your life becomes your book. <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> yes, because uh, you can write a very technical book without any emotion, any mood. But I don't like this style. I like to add uh, something uh, related to A little spice. Yes, <laughs> to I uh, like to enjoy this. Uh, uh, writing and it's not a, a, a very sad, boring uh, writing. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is nice. And uh, maybe what's the thing you like the least about writing a book? Uh, what's it? Sorry. The thing you it... like the least, the thing that you don't like in writing a book. Ah, okay. Uh, the deadlines. The deadlines. Yeah. Like deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they are very strict, uh, and uh, and you have to be to respect them. You can't uh, ask the um, the editor to delay of some days, but you can delay of uh, one month. You can't. And so yeah. maybe sometimes you are in pressure that you have to 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 write this before that date. The chapter should be ready. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Cool. So maybe we can dive more into the book, right? So data storytelling with Altair and uh, AI. Um, maybe first question is why Altair? Why there? So. For the people that are not very familiar with all the plotting libraries, right? In Python, there, there are quite a few. Um, I think the basic one, the most, I don't know if it's the most popular, but the basic one is uh, Matplotlib. Yes. Right? Um, and then there's a Seaborn, which I think is built on top of that, which is a bit fancier graphs. Uh, why why Altair? Uh, why, I'm not even sure. If it's Altair? Altair? How do you pronounce it, actually? Do you know? I don't know. I say Altair, but I I know it's wrong. But I like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can go. We roll with Altair uh, for this for this chat. Um, why 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 Altair? Because I think it's the um, the only Python library which uh, uh, which is uh, suitable for data storytelling. Because oh. Altair contains different uh, um, functions, uh, provides different functions and methods you can use to transform your data uh, dynamically while building your, uh, your uh, chart. And also it receives as an input directly a pandas data frame. Instead, in Matplotlib, you have to modify something before uh, before uh, using the data frame. Uh, and so Altair is more uh, versatile. Um, I have uh, um, I have tested also Matplotlib, but it, it, when you want to build a story, uh, you want to insert annotations. Uh, or context or text, uh, Altair it's, uh, is better. And that- More uh, user friendly. Uh, uh, sorry, what? Like you mean that it's user friendly, like it's yes. easier to use, yes. the API is nicer and all these things. Yes, and for this, um, I have a student now that is building a, a Python library for data storytelling at the top of uh, Altair. Um, oh, no. Because, yes, uh, in Python, there, there is not a, a library for uh, uh, data storytelling. 
and uh, we are uh, we are defining uh, this uh, with methods such as uh, add context, add annotation, because for example, if you uh, look at um, D3, which is a JavaScript uh, library for uh, uh, data visualization, uh, there is uh, um, an additional plugin uh, which provides uh, um, the possibility to add annotations, for example, very easily. Instead, in Python, you can't. You have to manually calculate the position of a text within a chart. Instead, mm. if you have directly a library for data storytelling, you can use it very quickly. And we are defining this. I see. So this is the, the library you mentioned, right? D3 yeah. is a, it's yes. JavaScript, so you cannot use it in Python. And it has some really nice... Uh, there's yes. also the interactivity to it, right? And I think yes. And uh, Altair is built on the top of Vega Lite, which is a grammar which uses D3. And for this, uh, um, for this reason, Altair is very, um, very user friendly because D3 uh, and, um, allows you to build many, many visual uh, uh, stuff in all the ways. Hmm, interesting. Um, yeah, I think this is the, the GitHub page for out there. Yes. Uh, actually, it's Vega out there. So indeed, uh, they actually um, yes taking from the 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 how do you call it the grammar, right? Yes. So or maybe what's for people that never heard of this visualization grammar? Uh, how would you explain it to them? A visualization grammar is a, a set of rules. Uh, to describe a chart. And um, Vega, Vega uh, uses a JSON to describe all the parts of the chart. And uh, um, for example, if you have uh, an axis, you use uh, uh, the key X axis and uh, the value, the value of the axis, for example. And uh, um, Altair is, is a Python interface to build Vega graphs. Hmm. So it's like the, under the hood, it's still uh, Vega, which you said uses D3. So it's JavaScript. But yes. then Altair is like a translation layer between these yes. programming languages, kind of. Yes. Yes. Yeah, this yes. is cool. This is cool. In, fa in and fact, in, a, in a, an advanced use of Altair could be to insert directly the Vega sign, sign, uh, code in uh, the chart. It's an advanced use, but uh, I don't cover it in the book. Yes, maybe also to touch a bit in the book, and I, I, I skimmed through it, like I mentioned. Um, it's a mix between theory. Uh, there's also some examples, like you mentioned, some anecdotes. But there are also some uh, some code, right? So it is also for people to to get practical with it. It's not just uh, the foundations, but there is also some uh, hands-on, let's say. So I thought it was a really really nice mix, really nice mix. And um, and you one thing you mentioned that I thought it was interesting. You said Matplotlib is a plotting library, right? Uh, but it's not a data storing. Well, it's not a not very well suited for data storytelling. Yes. So how would you make the compare the differences between like just like a plotting library? What makes a good plotting library or what makes a good data storytelling sto data storytelling library? You already mentioned some things like adding the context easily and finding the locations of uh, objects in your plot. But is there something else that you add to it? Yes, uh, essentially a data storytelling library should tell a story with your chart. And a, a, a story has a, um, characters and plots, and a, a, and a plot. But uh, this is a, a deep level of uh, uh, of usage of data storytelling. In terms of a chart, a data store, a visual story, a chart in a store. Uh, sorry, a um, data, a data store, a data chart. A, data visualization, no, sorry. Eh. <laughs> That's tricky, I know. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yes. A, a chart telling a story, okay? Now I'm yes. here. Now we got it. 
Okay. And chart telling a story should have a good title, a subtitle, some annotations. You have also to put credits in your chart. And the most important thing in every story, there is an end of the story. And the, the end in data storytelling is adding next steps. Hmm. What should we do after reading a story? And this is done by the next steps. Examples of the next steps could be learn more, maybe a click a button to click to learn more about the topic, or an action that you can uh, do. For example, uh, a decision for decision makers. You could provide some different uh, uh, options uh, in your next step part. And so a story should have these parts. In Matplotlib, you have to uh, integrate all these parts uh, separately. You can do it. You can, you still mm -hmm. can. But it's more difficult. In Altair, you can build layers. And so with your layer, each layer could contain a part of the story. And uh, you can use uh, just the first layer or add uh, more layers with annotations and uh, next steps, uh, credits, and uh, so on. This is the right. difference. You have different layers uh, you can so work you, on. So if I, well, I'm going to try to repeat what you said in my words to make sure that I'm understanding. Um, out there, it, it, set, it's set up in a way that it's easier to define these different layers. And when you're trying to build a data story, it's useful to have this concept of layers because you, there are different components that you want in your in your plot, in your data, basically, to tell this story. Whereas Matplotlib is more uh, building blocks, let's say. So you could still do this, but it becomes harder to achieve that because it's too low level, right? Like the way that it's organized, it's not made for this. Is that, is yes. that a good uh, rephrasing? Yes. Good summary, great. <laughs> Got an A. <laughs> cool. Very nice, very nice. So maybe in about your book, so uh, it's structured in different parts, right? So the first one is introducing out there in generative AI to data storytelling. We already talked about uh, Altair. Um, what about the generative AI part? How we are, anything, yes. what, how does the generative AI part come into this? And that's actually what I thought was the most surprising when I when I saw I think because the, the title is just data storytelling without there an AI, and when I saw that it was generative AI, I was I was a bit surprised. I was like, ah, okay, cool. So, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, just a, a quick note: the title has changed over the course of the book. Before the first title was data storytelling with Altair and GitHub Copilot. The first ah, time, okay. yes, because at the beginning the uh, the book included only GitHub Copilot. Oh. GitHub Copilot is a, a, um, an assistant for uh, writing code. Um, yes, it's very famous. But then I uh, decided to include also other aspects of uh, generative AI, and uh, in particular uh, uh, ChatGPT and uh, Dolly to generate uh, uh, images. And the title moved to AI-assisted data storytelling. Okay. And this was the second title. But then AI-assisted data storytelling, it um, was not uh, good. And there was a third, fourth title. And finally, the title was uh, this one, data storytelling with Altair and AI. So the types of AI included in the book are ChatGPT, Dolly, and uh, GitHub Copilot. GitHub Copilot is used as an assistant to uh, build uh, the, the raw chart. And so you build, you use uh, Copilot to, uh, to build uh, the chart in Altair. Uh, instead, yes. um, Copilot, uh, ChatGPT is used to generate in two ways. The first way is to uh, generate uh, the more engaging uh, 
a text and the for example the title or the, um, the, 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 the subtitle, the annotations for different types of audiences. And uh, in the book you also use uh, RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation, to um, use um, uh, AI, generative AI, to adapt the content, for example, of your uh, data to a specific audience. You extract from the, for a, a set of documents you have, you mm. extract the, the main uh, content, and you can adapt, for example, to a public uh, of uh, executives, of professionals, uh, or uh, to a general audience. So uh, this is, you mentioned, this so, the copilot, the first part is also so the copilot is a coding assistant, right? But it's AI, yes. AI powered. But then you mentioned so you can use you use in the book the use of copilot for setting the the best titles, the best subtitles. So it's still about the content. It's not necessarily about the code still. No, uh, this is ChatGPT for the code. Ah, ChatGPT. Oh, sorry, yes. sorry for the, the content. content for the content. Yes, yes. yes. Instead, copilot. Yes. And you also mentioned the the rag component. Could you just? Uh, I'm not sure if I fully understood. So maybe for the people that are listening that have heard of rag, could you also explain a bit what rag is and how does the red fit it? Rag fit in the the data storytelling. Um... Yes, rag is a, a technique, generally speaking, to fine tune a a, a, a lang large language model on a specific topic. So uh, in the book, you take uh, your uh, data, you have, uh, for example, a set of documents about the topic you are uh, investigating. You give this uh, set of documents to your uh, uh, RAG model and you um, extract a, a summary or a description for your uh, chart, for example, the description, an annotation, a title, based on the content of your documents. And you can decide if you want to uh, um, use this uh, data story for different um, types of audiences. For example, you have the documents, you can decide the extracted title for a general audience, extracted mm. title for uh, an audience of professionals. And the, the model generates different titles based on your needs. This is uh, very interesting for, um, especially for developers who don't uh, have sometimes the, the skills of communication and they can automate this process using uh, uh, generative AI. And uh, I the second, yes. So, so it's like you have the still the graph, the plots, the data, the foundations are the same, but then you want to tweak a bit the, the type of title to cater more to a general audience or to more business audience or more technical audience. But the values of the plot, it's they're still the same, it's just, about the story, like in how you hook people in and the links and all these things to further yes. read. Yes. Oh, okay. The chart is the same, but you can decide to use different titles, annotations, and much more based on your audience. And also on your objective. For example, if you want to entertain an audience, you can ask to generate a, a joke based on your uh, data. <laughs> Have you tried that? Are the jokes good? No, I didn't. But uh, I usually use for uh, in, to inform or to yeah. <laughs> make a title more persuasive, but not for jokes. But you can, you can. Okay, cool. And you and mentioned so is, we talked yeah. about Copilot, we talked about ChatGPT and Dali. Uh, yeah, maybe for the people that don't know exactly what Dali is, because I think today it's yes. built in ChatGPT. Yes, but uh, just uh, another thing, you can use uh, uh, ChatGPT also for another uh, purpose in the book, and uh, that is to um, generate uh, uh, ideas. Ah, because, like a brainstorming tool. Yes, yes, mm. because uh, um, uh, because uh, it's uh, maybe you can discuss with the ChatGPT to uh, uh, 
to extract new, new ideas about uh, a, a topic. Uh, I don't use ChatGPT to extract insights from data because at the time of uh, writing the book, uh, this was not possible. But maybe an updated version of the book could include also this uh, part. Yeah, because I can imagine if it takes one year, it's probably very hard to because this Gen AI stuff is moving very quickly these days. Yes, yes. Yeah. And also Dolly, Dolly is to, for generating images. And um, maybe the images generated in the book are uh, less uh, engaging than the, the, the ones that uh, you can see in uh, Dolly. But uh, so the, the, um, the techniques, uh, the concepts are still valid. I see. Very, very, very cool. Um, maybe also, so you, you were talking a lot about the data storytelling before. I think you mentioned in your classes, you also talk about Power BI and Tableau. You also talked about some plotting libraries. Um, could you compare a bit the all the, the things we've mentioned so far, like the dashboarding tools uh, and also, I guess, data storytelling? What, what is the difference between them? Could you use something like Tableau or Power BI to do the data story? Would you say it's a, it's a good tool for that? Or, or not? Yes, indeed. Uh, Tableau, I think it's a, 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 is a, has a learn a very low learning curve because it's very difficult to learn. But once you have under learned it, it's a, a wonderful tool to uh, represent uh, charts uh, and uh, uh, maps and uh, so on. And uh, I also, in the final part of the book, there is also a, um, a comparison uh, with the Tableau. And you can also incorporate your charts in uh, Tableau. I describe how to incorporate your charts in Tableau and Power BI, and also in Comet, because I wrote the previous book on Comet. And the difference is that uh, um, in Tableau, you can still uh, write uh, uh, stories. Uh, it's uh, even, uh, uh, I think, maybe it's even better than Python for writing uh, uh, stories. Uh, but it's not for uh, developers. In the book, I developed the idea that if you write all, all your analysis in Python, it could be the best solution is to build also your communication part in Python. Because yeah. you usually write the code in Python and the report you write in using another tool. But instead, you can write everything in Python. And you can use Altair to do this. The fun thing is that I have tried to implement some case studies that I propose in the book, also in Tableau. <laughs> and the ah, result, okay. yes, and the result is quite similar, yes. <laughs> ah, really? Okay, okay. So I guess yes. if someone that is doing their analysis in Python, but they already know Tableau, it's also a good tool for them to yes. apply these principles in Tableau. Yes, the principle you can apply the principles uh, I describe in the book also to other uh, uh, tools, not. Uh, uh, also to Matplotlib if you want the principles. Then the code yeah. is uh, specific for uh, Python Altair. Yeah, and maybe you talked a bit about these principles and I see you refer in the book the DIKW um, pyramid. Uh, would you like to, I, I'm assuming that that's, well, maybe you want to explain a bit what is this pyramid and how this ties to data storytelling? Yes, I indeed I met for the first time this pyramid uh, in a book by Jose Berengueres, which is data visualization something. And I liked, I loved this idea. Um, the, this pyramid is means data, it starts from the bottom, it, it means data, information, knowledge, wisdom. And this pyramid moves from data to wisdom. And the idea in the, in the book is also to move from raw data to wisdom. At, when you reach the wisdom level, you have built a, a data-driven story. Yes, this is the, the pyramid, data. Yes, 
For the yes. people following on the audio, I just put on the screen, like you just run the Wikipedia, it's just the, the data. So it's a pyramid, and again, like as you mentioned, in the bottom you have data, then it goes up to information, then it stacks up to knowledge and wisdom. And then I guess what you're saying is that if you do a good data story, people are yeah. on the wisdom part. You start from the facts, but they they acquire wisdom, let's say. Toward the end. Yes. And the, when you move from data to information, you extract, you are extracting an insight from data because you have uh, um, you have answered to a question and you you have filtered your data, which are raw data, and extracted just one insight from your data. At the information level, you have an insight. At this level, you represent your chart. This next level is at, um, from information to knowledge. When you move from in to information to knowledge, you add context to your data, which means that you are uh, enriching your data, your information with the background. The background is all the relevant things that the audience must know to understand your uh, chart. And uh, it, the context depends on your audience. If you have an audience of uh, technical people, you don't need to add the details, uh, technical details, because they, only, they already know them. But if you have a general audience, you have to add uh, a general overview of your uh, data, what they represent, what they are, and so on. Finally, when you uh, add the final level from knowledge to wisdom, you are um, tailoring your chart for a specific um, audience, a, a specific culture, a specific, um, maybe you are talking, to, you are telling your story to a people uh, uh, located, I don't know, in uh, in uh, China, which has different uh, uh, background than me, and so you need to adapt the story to to them to make them understand your uh, story. And, and, you, also, and then I guess if you're changing the the that layer, I guess. So I think we're in the knowledge layer, right? So we're from data information, information to knowledge. Can you reuse the bottom of the pyramid for other cultures? So you, the example you gave is, is is China, but if you say Brazil, I'm from Brazil, yeah. by the way. So can yeah. you reuse the bottom to the idea is that you can still use the bottom two layers yes. of it? Yes. And also you add a call to action to your story. You invite the audience to do something after encountering your story. And I really like this pyramid because it's a, a, a conceptual framework uh, that helps you to uh, to transform data into story. All right, that's really really cool. And that's what you dive in on the part two of the book. Yes. Right. And then on part three, you have delivering the the data story, which I guess you talk a bit more about the the Gen AI and some dangers or some things that you can. Yes. Dive in there. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. There, there are some um, ethical, uh, maybe ethical problems you can uh, have when uh, when you use uh, the AI. You have uh, uh, always to. You must always check the produced content because uh, maybe they they could generate. Uh, they could have bias, hallucinations, and uh, so on. And so you have to control the output, uh, the produced uh, output. Uh, recently, yeah. I've uh, attended a conference where uh, the main topic was about explainable AI. I don't uh, deal with this topic in my book, but I think that uh, this explainable AI is uh, try to explain what the, uh, the AI produces and why they the AI generates this type of content, and I see. I think that this is a, a good direction of uh, of study, especially in uh, research. Yeah, yeah, I do think so. Especially with the Gen AI, Gen, Gen AI models, that they get bigger and they get less explainable, and yeah, there's the risk of hallucination uh, a lot of the times, right? So, 
you know, I think now more than ever, I think this is a very, very relevant uh, field of research. Um, indeed, and you mentioned uh, some examples, I thought, so just to sneak peek of the book, um, you mentioned like, yeah, if you put people in different colors, um, the color sometimes associated to moods, right? So maybe some things that you're not intended. So this is just to, to give an example, right? If you say, give me a picture of a man in a yellow chair, maybe there are other things that the model will output that are not intended, right? Maybe if it says yellow, does it mean, does it specify a mood? Does it specify a race? Does it specify something there that you also need to take into account, right? And you also give some practical um, tips as here, right? Because uh, in ChatGPT, or there is also the problem of reproducibility, right? So there is a temperature parameter that you can say if you want something that is very um, stochastic in a way, right? You can you can opt that in, and you also give some practical examples of how you can make things reproducible, how you can verify that these things are going. Okay. Maybe question: How do you come up with these examples? Is it just from your experience? Or, um... Yes, from my, my experience, I did some tests and I realized that there, uh, there were uh, the, these problems. But re regarding reproducibility, I have read a very uh, exciting thing. Maybe the, the listeners already know, but I have read in a book entitled uh, A Damn a um, Fine book of stable diffusion or something uh, like this. That uh, this book is about generating images uh, with the um, stable diffusion, and um, you can use uh, pass a parameter to these uh, models, uh, which is called um, seed the seed parameter which generates always the same images. Hmm. And so it's a deterministic uh, approach. And from this, I have realized that also ChatGPT, according to me, generates the same uh, outputs with the same seed, but you don't see the seed. Hmm. But then the seed is like produced at runtime? Or is it just something that, uh, how, how do you specify the seed? If you in, see uh, in stable diffusion, you pass it as a parameter of the function. Hmm. And so but you then, can decide. Yeah, because stable diffusion is open source, or yeah, right? Yeah. Stable diffusion yes, is open I source. See, uh, yes, yes. ChatGPT is not open source. No, ChatGPT you can't, but uh, um, I think that there is this parameter, but you cannot set. It's not hmm. open to people, but you can. I see. I see. Yeah, I it's think this is this. Uh, yeah, yeah, could be. I think the 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 reproducibility part of Gen AI also interests me when it comes to building applications that you want to test, right? Um, so how can you make sure? How can you like? Yeah, one of the first things you have a bug, right? And then people are like, "Oh, I cannot reproduce the bug. It doesn't work on my machine, so I cannot help you, right?" And I think with Gen AI, there's a bit of that. Ah, oh, yeah, Gen ChatGPT told me something that violates whatever. It's like, well, how how did you do this, right? And if you cannot reproduce, it's not that it's useless, but it's it's a bit less helpful, right? To to really yeah. debug. So that's also something that I'm personally interested in as. Gen AI becomes more and more industry ready, let's say. Right? How yes. can we how can we test these things? So uh yes. yeah. Very, very, very cool, uh, cool stuff as well. I see that you really dive in the, the data story, data storytelling parts. Maybe if you had to summarize for someone like an elevator pitch, maybe, uh, what makes a good data story? What does it how do you know that a data story is good according to you? Um, there are uh... The first element is it, it, uh, uh, the audience understands the message and retells it to another audience or acts based on what the story tells. Yeah. This is the first thing. The second, you can recognize if a story is a good data story if it has characters and a plot and this is what i explain in my next book which is become a great data storyteller where you will see how 
to extract characters and plots from uh, uh, data. You will build a, a sidekick of the, you will extract a, a hero from data which, uh, who has uh, an objective to reach, but, to reach, but there is a problem between uh, the hero and the object of desire. You will extract an antagonist and, uh, uh, and so on. This is my next book. I will reveal it uh, when my book uh, will, uh, yes. uh, will uh, be published. And then next year we can sit down again and chat about your new book as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, no, I think, I think it's cool. I also really like the idea of, uh, I, I do think that stories, they, they, they have, they're very powerful in the sense that um, it's it's sticky. I think I read also a book, uh, Make It Stick, uh, mm -hmm. which talks about like, the, I, don't know, I don't know, maybe uh, I can look real quickly here. Um, but it basically, it's in a way, it's about stories that are memorable so and i was thinking about it when you said a good data story is when it's retold to someone else or yes. it kind of touches people right it's not just something you hear and then you kind of forget about it you go on your day it's something that stays with you and on the make it stick book they also talk about some some things in that realm right they kind of try to identify some patterns right and even one of the things on the on the book that they talk about is making putting stuff in a story right i think we relate a lot to to stories and it's something that we can kind of it's we can empathize with um so if you have something good to say but you can say it well i think it, it's way more powerful than just saying stuff right so i definitely think it's a very worthwhile topic i think uh, there's a lot of uh, stuff that to to unravel so i think it's really cool that you do all this nice work as well and put everything on a nice structure format for all of us you already mentioned that you have your next book coming up uh, in January. Yes. Um, so good luck with Thank that. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else that you want to uh, share before we wrap it up and call this a, a pod? I suggest you to, to the audience also to uh, read a lot, to study and to enjoy uh, coding because uh, it's very fun to try new things and to to code yes, yes. i agree definitely agree i subscribe to that maybe people <laughs> on your um how can people find you you mentioned you have a, a blog uh yes. what can can we share this here as well yes it's uh, or maybe uh, we can put on the show notes as well if you can send okay, it to me and we put it on the, on the show notes so if people want to find you on your blog there, the book is the data storytelling with out there and Gen AI, or oh, AI, sorry, not Gen AI. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's it. Let's see. Yes. Yeah. How can people buy your book, by the way? So what's the best way that people can? Amazon, I think. Amazon, it's... that's the best, yes. best, best bang for your buck there. Yes, or the Manning website where there are the special offer uh, uh, sometimes there are promotions and maybe there uh, or uh, or here uh, in the O'Reilly platform. Yeah, yeah, I just opened the first one, but you hear, you heard here first. Go to Amazon, get your book there, get your copy. Thank you very much for taking this time to chat with us. Um, good luck. Well, I, I imagine you have a lot of deadlines for your next book as well, so <laughs> I'll let you do it. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you for to you for uh, it was a pleasure to yeah, chat thanks. with you today in a way that's meaningful to software people. Thank you. Okay. Hello, I'm Bill Gates. I would I would recommend uh, TypeScript. Yeah, it writes a lot of code for me, and usually it's slightly wrong. I I'm reminded, incidentally, of Rust here. R Rust. Rust. This almost makes me happy that I didn't become a supermodel. Cooper and Nettys. Well, I'm sorry, guys. I uh, I don't know what's going on. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about large neural networks. It's it's really an honor to be here. Rust. 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 Data topics. Welcome to the data. Welcome to the data topics podcast. <laughs>